Thank you so much for joining us here um, for our deep dive session. My name is Rachel Moriarty, and I am the Director of Operations at the Schumacher Center for New Economics, which we call a think and do tank based in um, the Berkshires of Western Mass. Um, what we want to talk about today a bit is the need for access to land. Um, and we see land as really a pivotal issue in bringing forth a, an economy that is just and respectful, respectful of people and the planet. Um, and so at a time of an ever widening wealth gap and um, issue of land ownership, the need to broaden access to land is really crucial. Uh, we see land as um, at the heart of issues of equity, of affordable housing, of livable cities, regenerative agriculture, and ecological restoration. And so it's my pleasure to be working with my colleague Susan here, Susan Witt and Annette Royo, uh, to kind of look at the solutions to land reform. Um, a few weeks ago, George Mombio put out a report commissioned by the Labour Party in the UK about uh, land reform at a state level. And we think that it's also important to look at that issue at the community level. And so Nanette Royo is the executive director of the Tenure Facility, where she works with indigenous communities to identify opportunities for um, land reform and, inc and increase access to land. Um, and at the Schumacher Center, we are looking at issues of land reform in the context of the community land trust model. Um, and so what we propose today is talking for a few minutes. Both Susan and Nanette will introduce uh, their particular work, and then we will open it up for questions and have more of a dialogue. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Nanette. Um, should I stand? I think I should yeah. stand. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to share our 10-year facility story and our progress. And I would just like to begin to, uh, by appreciating all of you uh, individually at some point in the, today's meetings and, of course, the other friends that are older, older, not old age, uh, have been ha having a conversation about this. And uh, I really am amazed at the levels of uh, engagement and commitment that you all have. And so I'm very inspired to continue talking about our work because of you. Uh, the tenure facility was um, started uh, to make sure that we get land rights to indigenous people's groups, local community groups, to enable them to continue protecting their landscapes. And their landscapes, are, as we know, are the whole the last, last stands of forests in the world and last stands of biodiversity and watersheds. It's uh, significant, especially for what has been uh, seen by the UN Convention on Climate Change as really urgent. Um, and we are given 12 years to figure out our solutions. Um, they have uh, been trying to figure out these solutions for hundreds of years. Uh, and we are seeing cycles and cycles of land uh, challenges, empowerment and disempowerment uh, over probably, as I've, I've looked at that over 100 years, but it's longer. So these are just the people that we work with, just to give you a very clear uh, face. We work in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. I personally am a human rights lawyer, a land rights lawyer. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was in the southern Philippines, uh, essentially taught and educated by elders uh, of indigenous groups that are uh, at the precipice of understanding why they should get a title. Because they said that land is something that outlives us. How can we own it? 
um, one of the elders had been asking me this question. And he had agreed because he needed to protect his territory. He had then agreed, okay, we go through this process. So the big challenge really is that 2.5 billion people uh, live without the legal right to their land. And uh, they are unsafe because of it. Nonetheless, they do the work to protect these land and forests uh, at the risk of their lives of being displaced um, many times and sacrificing the culture of their sacred land. So this leads to deforestation a lot. Still, the, the struggle and the, the contestation is whether or not they can stand and, and say that they can negotiate a sustainable use of these lands and not have it all be deforested at, all at once. So this is the vision, and this is specific to tenure that we are looking at. But I would like to also open this conversation, I hope you would bring it up, that this tenure land rights is very political. And because it's political, it's uncertain and because it's uncertain, it's very risky. But the risk-taking work has already been done and is being done as we speak. So many in the places in the, in the border of, of the Amazon and different, different parts of Indonesia and um, uh, Latin America, so Brazil, especially the Amazon, Indonesia, and the Congo, the, the central, the DRC and the central Congo. Uh, we support them, indigenous peoples, local communities to secure their land and forests through grants. So that's how we do it. We have grants that we can make available directly to the community groups, to go through a process of registering themselves. So when we say direct, there, aren't, there, there, there are NGOs that help the, the, the indigenous people's groups, but they have to choose those. And so they have to tell us exactly what social process they went through to, to get these uh, eligible organizations to hold the money for them. Um, we also uh, acknowledge that it's risky and there's been deaths over the years for defending territory, but we choose the places where governments have said yes to some form of land rights. Uh, we cannot prioritize the, the ones that don't actually have anything because there is another level of advocacy that still needs to be done there that is not uh, the work we do. We respect it and we support it uh, with, uh, you know, with our hearts, but we cannot use the funds for that. So we wait until, so we refer them to advocates and others, but we wait until those legislations are in place and we work with the community groups that have those. So that's, uh, that's what we really uh, emphasize on get some government agency to buy into this process. You know, it could be any ministry, Ministry of Welfare, Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of uh, sometimes finance, uh, they come. So then we facilitate exchange and learning and many of the government partners that we have actually uh, invited to some of these learning processes have become very open and are committed to this process now. It's not still, it's not the ideal world because there's a lot of political economic transactions that happen, in, in, especially during elections, but it has happened. So there, there are uh, hundreds of community groups out there that are asking us for help. And uh, as, at the same time, we, we try to make sure that we are not uh, promoting this uh, dependency. And so we engage other actors, and this is where I feel that uh, the, the sustaining, the, to sustain this process, we need to look at different hubs of, of interests and groups working in the same landscape. 
looking at, for example, conservation, looking at uh, uh, sustainable harvesting of some resources, looking at health, uh, looking at uh, uh, women and the productive capacity, increasing the capacity of women. And then we put that in, in one basket as an entry point being land rights. But there are so many other layers. Um, so for, for now, uh, climate change and red, if we're not familiar with red, it's a reduced, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. Funds that are coming through the system are from, from those funds. And the countries that are supporting us uh, are Norway and Sweden. And they have funding that they want to make available for this process for a longer, for a longer period, gestation period. Uh, so we're just starting and we have 11 countries that we're supporting. Uh, but uh, the partnership that's required is for this, to, for this to sustain is to enable the, already the, the match of having livelihoods, thriving livelihoods, thriving uh, conservation and uh, other other activities. So for the pilot phase, uh, we had six countries from 2014 to 2017. And now we, the story, for example, that I, I can I tell you just maybe a couple, uh, that's very interesting is um, Peru. Uh, let me see if I have the, I have a lot of slides, but I want to show you. Uh, this are the Afro descendants of Colombia, for example. They're just uh, starting uh, the work. But I would like to Peru, uh, 2017 to 2019. Uh, they started with when the government, at the end of the end of 20, uh, 2016, was shifting. And uh, no, end of 2017. And it was very hard to get the titles to the, to the collective uh, territory, but it was easier to get titles for individuals that are surrounding the collective territory. And so uh, with the process of positioning individual experts in government offices, working with indigenous groups, they were able to go from 66 uh, hectares to a million point two hectares up to uh, the end of last year, the end of 2018. And uh, the, then the provincial government is now committed, uh, at least in Loreto province and in Madre de Dios. And if you add the uncontacted people territory there, that's 2.5 million hectares. And so these are concrete uh, units uh, of, of land and people that are operating in these areas that could now say they have a vision of what this territory would look like and they could set this vision up with support uh, from not just the tenure facility but their own government and other institutions. And they have identified so many problems, but uh, they're beginning to now say, let's walk the next, the next uh, mile and address those problems. So the women, for example, in one of the islands have, uh, they're Brazil nut harvesters, and they have allocated 10% of their harvest to continue the work of uh, ensuring, yeah, that titling uh, is, uh, is uh, essentially the adjacent communities could access the same kind of support. Uh, and so they have this funding and they have the, the trained uh, mappers and they have in increased technology and they have the, essentially the, the land registration unit partners working. So it's this kind of um, buy-in that they are able to, to do. Um, in Panama, for example, the, uh, there are 12 uh, indigenous comarcas, which are districts, is equivalent to districts that have aligned now from five. 
they've now from five to, so in the last program cycle, there's five, the, from five to 12 that are uh, essentially ensuring that uh, no land transactions are, are uh, done without, uh, that's, a, that's, that's inconsistent with the vision. And the vision is that to make this territory, uh, uh, make this territory reforested again. It's a reforest, some of the ones that are not forested, and protect the, the forested ones. And they're uh, again asking uh, if, if and when, for example, the project finishes, how would they continue, you know, ensuring that those, those areas are, are uh, protected. Uh, they have their plans and they have, this is where I, I was in the last discussion, the cryptocurrency uh, discussion became very relevant to, to, to this. Um, so this is the same uh, in, in Peru, this is India. So India, it, the Adivasi women are considered, uh, Adivasis are, are the indigenous uh, communities within the, the Forest Rights Act that actually have been given those rights but their, their actual registration in government takes a long time. And so this, this program would a aim to, again, get another million and a half hectares in addition to what they have. And they have now advanced to 500,000 there. The process of registration is ongoing. So it's not signed yet, but it's in that, in that form. So these are just, for me, uh, points that I would like to, to, to share. Essentially, this is also the same questions that we were asking each other and we were asking others that have been observing our program. Uh, there are, we're, not, we're not yet 100% uh, uh, ready to say our approach is the perfect approach. So we have, for example, what, what about women? And is it, so if it's collective, is it sec more secure for women? Or is it less secure for women? And uh, in Liberia, because it's women-led, the peace process there is women-led, they have positioned the, the, the land rights such that women really can, titles can get into their names, uh, or their names come up in the collective title they, that they mentioned. About, uh, so that's one. Um, Learning is a process, and learning, for, for us, it's not our learning, it's their learning, and it's translating what they do to a vision that is for longer and for the next generation is, is, is really what we are aiming for in, in this learning process. Um, and it's also informing uh, finance and informing you know, other thinkers about where they are, what they do, and how is it uh, going to respect what they do without, you know, that's, that's still voluntary. And, and if they have good education, they have good health care, they really don't want the money. But, but how, do, how do they communicate this process? How do they feel secure about it? Um, coordinating with other organizations, the tenure facility, cannot do a lot of things. We actually work just to support the indigenous groups and local community groups. And uh, as we begin now, we have to actually work with others and identify them and not wait until when we're finished or, or are finishing the, the project. Our, our project goes for, for three years and could be renewed for another three years. And then uh, after that, we need to really make sure that the government is already scaling it and or the partners are doing it uh, on their own. Um, how do we encourage potential donors to scale? How about uh, the conservation communities? There is this big target now of the 30% 30, 30 of the world is really uh, under threat and these are the areas that should be the focus for conservation efforts. 30% of the land in the world, so in the next 50 years. So that 30%, where is that 30%? Actually, it's in many of the, the places that local communities and indigenous peoples live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that partnership should happen. And how should that happen? Um, in a way that empowers. 
Um, so this is where I end. The time is now. And I take the tea. Send it, give yeah. it over to you. Thank you. So, so um, I'm so grateful uh, that Olivia introduced us to Nanette, because I did not know of her work. And it's complimentary and strengthening of our own. So um, thrilled to know of you and expect to have a lot of conversations and partnerships. So uh, the Schumacher Center is formed around the ideas of Fritz Schumacher, who, George, tell us about Fritz Schumacher. Tell us Schum about Fritz Schumacher. Well, he was a, um, a thinker who um, recognized that we have an ambition to make everything big and, uh, and inaccessible to people. And so he reversed the thinking to uh, small thinking, small, uh, modest living, and uh, small edu education that is absolutely direct to people's lives. So small is beautiful is the way I think of Schumacher. <laughs> right. <coughs> but he was a, a teacher and, a, and, and in a way a prophet. Yeah. He actually said the sanest approach to economics was um, to that the goods uh, consumed in a region would be produced there. So he talked about local economies. And what the Schumacher Center is focused on is ways that citizens can help support their local economies. Bob Swan was the founder of the Schumacher Center, was a good friend of, of Fritz Schumacher. In, at the Schumacher Center, we say that economics is nothing more than human ingenuity organizing labor to transform the natural world into new products for use by others. Kind of that simple and that noble. That system could be a system as human beings we could create that transformation in a way that's destructive or in a way that's healing to people and land. So what Bob Swan brought to us in his thinking was that land is necessary for all production, but it isn't itself something that should be capitalized. It's nature given. It's needed by all. But to actually capitalized land means that uh, you're creating value where no real value exists. The value comes in the transformed nature products, the new products, but the value isn't in the land itself. And when you capitalize land, those who own benefit from the need of all for land. Bob Swan um, was a conscientious objector in World War II. He spent two and a half years in federal prison because he was unwilling to have the government force him into shooting other people. It wasn't popular 
World War II was the good war. But his beliefs were so strong that he was willing to go to prison. And in prison, which he called his university, he never went to college, the CEO spent time sharing books and talking with each other. And one of those in prison with him was Baird Rustin. Does anyone know Baird Rustin's story? Who he was, what he did? Baird Rustin actually was the one who trained Martin Luther King in nonviolent techniques. He was the man behind the man. Correct, he was also gay. So he knew that it would be not useful to put himself forward. So he saw in Martin Luther King a leader who could come forward. So in prison, Baird Rustin shared his ideas with the other CEOs. When Bob left prison, he had to earn a living. He started a family right away. And he became a carpenter. In the South, in the rural South, when um, the black churches were burned, there was a call for black white crews to rebuild those churches. And Bob, known in the peace movement, known as a carpenter, was called down to help with that rebuilding. And there he met Slater King, who was an activist in the Albany movement. And Slater King told Bob something important. He said, the reason why there is such a crisis in the northern cities is southern blacks cannot get access to land. They're systematically excluded from land ownership. And that's forcing people out of the south into the northern cities. Bob had learned in prison that one of the root causes of war was the capitalization of land, the ability of nation states to control land that excluded other nation states in that conflict that came about. And he was exploring what land reform might look like. So he talked with um, Slater King about this, and they decided to do an experiment and create a new system of land tenure. They secretly, because if it was openly known that a group of blacks were buying this land, the sellers would be under pressure. They secretly took an option on 5,000 acre farm to become a farm for blacks in the South. But they needed a form. What would it look like? What would the ownership look like? And so they took a trip to Israel to study the lease agreements of the Jewish National Fund. As Israel was forming, um, there was an effort around the world by little old Jewish women to help buy the land that would become the future home of the Jews. And so they began collecting pennies for the Kiam Karim, the Jewish National Fund. And though it's not known well, 
most all of the land of Israel is owned either by the Kim Kramath or uh, the state of Israel. And the land is then leased. It's leased to individuals for their homes. It's leased to um, uh, intentional communities like a kibbutz. It's leased to a co-op housing project. It's leased to a mixed community like a Moshe Sheep, which has cooperative ownership of farmland, private ownership of homes. And that lease agreement separates ownership of land from the ownership of the buildings on the land. So that's what they took back in order to organize this 5,000 acre new communities in Albany, Georgia. That was a planning process, a year long planning process to work out the form. So community land trusts are nonprofit corporations that hold land and then lease it on 99 year leases. It's not 100 years or it'd be tantamount to ownership. There are resale restrictions that um, exclude the land value at the time of sale. So people can transfer their homes, but <coughs> not the land itself. And it restricts, it has environmental mm -hmm. restrictions according to um, uh, the nature of the land that's owned. There are a lot of wonderful examples of community land trusts. There are 250 in the United States. That's Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston. That land was required by eminent domain. I mean, that was extraordinary. The community won the right from Boston city government to take over abandoned lots. And the citizens became their own developers. What is this called? It's called Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, DSNI, on um, Martha's Vineyard. Again, high, high prices of land because so many second homeowners want to live there. Um, there's huge support for the community land trust that builds affordable housing and keeps it affordable for year-round people. Another initiative, the local hospital uh, couldn't find housing for its nurses, its doctors who lived off island, right? So in an emergency, they'd have to ferry in. And the ferry doesn't run all the time. So the community land trust partnered with um, the hospital to build affordable housing. Um, this is Bob Swan in 1987 in um, the community land trust in the Southern Berkshires, but 18, uh, 21 acres site and built 18 units clustered on five acres in what's a heated up second home community in the Berkshires. Uh, but it, the community land trust can also be applied not just to housing, but also to farmland. Indian Line Farm is the first community-supported agriculture farm in the country when the middle woman, its owner, Robin Benan, died much too early. Um, the land would have gone to a second homeowner, the house taken down, the fields unkept. Uh, the community land trust worked with the Nature Conservancy to buy the land, the farmers bought the buildings, and it 
continues as a CSA farm. So what we have recognized is the community land trusts provide a very extraordinary, fair, voluntary, democratically structured way to hold land. But it's uh, the amount of land in community land trusts is much under the knee. We see a growing call for reparations. Community land trusts could be viable holders of land that is leased exclusively to black and immigrant families as part of a reparations movement. But there is not enough money in foundations and governments to meet the need of, of redistributing land. Not enough. It's huge. There will be a redistribution. There is a call for it. It can either be done voluntarily or it'll be done by a taking. We'd like to create the basis for a voluntary movement of land risk redistribution by calling for a global alliance for land gifting. Rachel referred to George Mambiat's piece, Land for the Many, in The Guardian, where he said, the unaddressed problem sitting in the middle of the room is land access. And he came up with government solutions. We're looking at voluntary citizen solutions. When I was in London, I met with Tom Chance, who's had uh, the UK Alliance for Community Land Trusts. Remember, in the US, there are only 250 community land trusts at the moment. And Sorry. The, uh, that's from 1970 when Bob, when the first community land trust got started. Since 2009 in the UK, there are 350 community land trusts. And I said, Tom, how did you do it? And he said, well, it's mostly rural. He said, an estate owner sees the village starting to decline, the kids leaving. And the estate owner says, well, I've got five acres. You could have it to build some housing for local people. That pulls together a group of citizens who create the community land trust to accept the land and begin the organization. They're together. They like being together. They built the housing. And then they go, oh, the pub's failing. We could buy the pub, take the land value out, sell it back to a new pub owner, because what's an English village without a pub? And the town market, we could now buy that. And then the neighboring town says, we want one of those. How did you do it? So it's a movement that in England is growing by word of mouth, um, uh, town by town. And we're calling for such a movement in the US and then globally.
question. Yeah. The framework conventions, yeah, the UNFCCC um, has in one of its um, preambular articles the respect for indigenous people's uh, rights and local communities. And that's also in uh, now the, the many uh, countries that have signed on to these agreements on, um, on climate uh, have the indigenous people's local communities uh, essentially respecting these rights, convention biodiversity, traditional knowledge. So there are many, gender, and then the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that's one uh, that's been signed on to. Many uh, international agreements uh, fall short when a national government refuses to recognize. But, uh, but where we work in these 11 countries, there are national provisions for recognition, either the constitution or some other provisions. So we, we rely a lot on, on that. And the big challenge is there is, these, there is the collective uh, rights of indigenous peoples, local communities in areas that are public from the government's classification. So it's forests, it's all these commons. And, so, and because of the constitution of these countries, they are still really uh, reserved or will, will, they are recognized as they, meaning indigenous peoples, are recognized as having owned or having had rights to those lands. So that's where, where the, the balance is now, is to how to, to, to structure the ownership of these assets. Uh, and you know, for posterity, for many countries, this is something, areas that they should be protecting. And for the communities that are there, for, so that they are con able or continue to be protecting those territories. And the farmers in these places where they don't have land, can then also uh, interact and share. In, in where, we, where we are in some countries, the farmers uh, are in local communities. They belong to that category. So we have indigenous peoples in local communities. They have the same pr problems mm -hmm. that uh, have no access. And so state has to reclassify public land for, for that access. Or indigenous peoples groups agree with local community groups to co-manage very specific uh, follow-up action to the initial tenure or land rights work uh, that I see are stronger in places where the communities are solidifying around, let's say, uh, other agendas, like, like the ones that they really care about. Yes, some are in farm, some are in health. Yeah, some are, and they are much more able to, con to position themselves better for negotiation. Yeah. Well, just like the net set, Groups are organizing around issues. So a group called Agrarian Trust has taken the community land trust model and is looking for gifts of farmland. And they'll make sure that um, the land that's donated is managed responsibly. Um, there are a number of um, uh, groups of people of color, like the Northeast Farmers of Color, who um, are organizing, um, led by Leah Penniman. She's this extraordinary woman farmer. And she talks about the need for um, uh, blocks to return to the land, to learn the skills of the land, um, to educate around issues of the land. She was our speaker last year at the Schumacher Center. And she said, Susan, every time I give a talk, someone offers me land. But I know I'm not the right recipient. So she knows she has to organize um, a catcher's mitt in order to accept that land. So that's why she organized Northeast Farmers of Color. And they're organizing as a community land trust with a specific purpose. Our outreach is going to be talking about how 
gifts of working land, meaning land for housing, land for farming, land for manufacturing, land for our retail centers, right, should be as common to community land trusts as gifts of ecologically sensitive lands to conservation land trusts. So that means tr uh, we're planning training of, of philanthropic advisors. Lawyers need to understand it. Estate planners need to know as um, uh, they're working with estates that gifts of land can be made and the donor's wishes could be kept. Um, uh, our speaker at this year's lecture will be Sally Calhoun. Uh, she's in Pasinas, California. She um, sold out her tech firm, you know, cashed out, bought a 7,000 acre ranch kind of by chance, you know, be, started to become responsible for it. Her heirs have all they need. So she's looking at creating a community land trust to be the eventual holder of that land. And she is now convening groups of women who own large ranches and farms and a program called, um, what's it called? Lead with Land. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another initiative is um, as part of a foundation appeal that we're making is to convene a group of correspondents like George Mambiat and have not war correspondents, but land access correspondents. Train these correspondents as a group around these issues. Edu bring them together, let them feel themselves as a team and educate them about land rights issues. So core to the community land trust model is this idea of a tripartite board in that it's a democratic decision-making process. So normally you'd have a third of the board represented as leaseholders, a third professional members of the community um, with relevant skills for what sort of development issues you're looking to pursue in your community. The third would be community members who are of the membership-based organization that kind of um, upholds the community land trust. And so that ensures that no one voice controls that process. Um, so in our case in the Berkshires, we have an architect, we have a lawyer, um, and someone who's working in development. And to further address both of your questions, so the difference between the tribal ownership and a community land trust ownership is there is private ownership of buildings and a secure lease so it's mortgageable, right? I mean, um, the big failure, one of the major failures of the tribal land system is the inability of tribal mem members to get mortgages because they're not owning the land, right? The lease becomes a lien against the land and it's, um, uh, they're permitted mortgages on it. So when Nutna Leduc faced the problem of um, in uh, the White Earth Land Reservation, uh, a group of liberal good doers said, oh my dears, you don't understand land ownership, so let us divide your land into little uh, lots, and you each own a lot. And then there was 
uh, movement of financiers to say, oh, don't you want some money? You can finance your land and we'll give you a lot of money. And so parts of the land were lost to um, mortgage taking. Some were just sold off. So instead of having an intact white earth land reservation, it was little holes through it. Well, it's the people that live um, on all the land. Uh, there's berry picking. There's rice gathering in, in the lakes. Uh, there's hunting in the forest. And that's their tradition. So that, too, was broken up. So Winona created a community land trust to regather those tribal lands. And again, if you, she spoke about this in a Schumacher lecture, you can find it on her website, and it's totally inspiring. Um, it was January of 2017 that um, the Schumacher Board of Directors turned to us and said, apply this community land trust concept to uh, black reparations and indigenous reparations. And um, as a result of that thinking, we separated the two issues because clearly, um, indigenous communities need contiguous lands. And that's a different approach than a reparations movement, which might deal with scattered sites. So um, we actually proposed the creation of a national black land trust that could accept gifts of land because just like Leia, is at the end of every talk, is seeing gifts of land coming to her. You know, we know they're out there. We hear the stories from just people in our area who are fourth homeowners, not even second homeowners. They're fourth homeowners. They don't need that land, but they don't know what to do with it. So it normally falls into an estate, is sold off, and becomes, you know, money in a foundation. How better than to donate the land? So Leah is taking that initiative up. But yeah, does that help? In states and countries we work, the Constitution has a very clear recognition of the rights, property rights, of local people, indigenous peoples in this particular case. Uh, the recognition of these chunk of land. The work that we're doing then is to measure where these areas are with the community groups. Because they, they're there, so they're time immemorial rights, not yet owned by government but uh, generally considered public, forests, forest areas. So then uh, the definition is uh, the gazettement of these territories had happened in Indonesia, it happened in the Philippines, it happened in Liberia, it happened in Cameroon, it happened in uh, Peru, yeah? So uh, in the places where we're, we're, so the gazettement is the measuring of where the public ends and where the private begins, private collective collective of the indigenous groups. So that's where these millions that are we're, we're talking about, that we've projected 4.2 here in our brochure now, not projected, <coughs> the, the actual count. Uh, so it's chunks that the indigenous groups don't really want to divide and don't want to sell and don't want to, because they're contiguous territories, hunting grounds, forests, uh, protecting for everyone, essentially. For, for, for so corporations haven't exploited this land at all? There are now areas that have direct right. conflict. Right. 
direct, meaning that the government has, has granted a concession to an area that's actually part of the indigenous so territory. Forestry or agriculture, or, yeah. So there, there are these questions about, about the governance of these huge territories, the ownership of the collective, and the agreement not to break it uh, and, and, and sell or have it be converted into other types of land use. And so this is the next challenge. And in fact, this is not actually linear. It can begin with looking at how to manage these territories with the carbon or what is uh, being protected now by, by the world. And so that may be the first, the, the first step. But so what we do is marry those two interests and make sure that there is a generally a common ground. So it's, it's rare that we're getting the common ground that we're getting, and we, we're aware that it could be short-lived with some of the political interests that are coming in and in, in uh, some places. But there are also some good developments in other countries. But that's where, where it is. And so this uh, next step is where we also think is a big, big, big challenge. Yeah, so if we want to protect these areas, we have to come together and decide what to do. And so the, com com the land trusts is a, is a good example of one, one form, but what would be other forms? And what would it look like for cryptocurrency that we're talking about earlier? So do we really need to have it you know, in, in a form that governments can, ex can, can, can exchange for uh, concessions? Or do, is there other, uh, is there another um, way of, of securing this? Um, so so, so the, the collective title is the way we're doing it now. So, so how, how that survives into the future is the, is the, big, the big question. Because the debate, and has always been, after the debate, it, the communities would say, no, we don't want it broken apart into individual titles. We recognize there are individual ownerships. So there's in the private collective. So there's private collective within the governance uh, and, and uh, arrangements. But uh, it's generally collective. So, so it's decided together. Yeah. So last month, I was at a conference on Fogo Island in Canada, and one of the participants was um, the chief of a tribe that's 100 miles north of, uh, or the seat of the tribe is 100 miles north of Toronto. And she had just won a $6 billion settlement from the Canadian government. Now, there are 275 tribal members. That's it. Only 70 of which actually live on tribal land. So she was trying to think through what's the appropriate use of the $6 billion. And when she heard of the community land trust, she said, ah, I can buy land in Toronto and put it into a tribal community land trust. My members who are already living in Toronto can own their own homes, but the land remains forever in the trust. So it's a flexible concept. Remember Israel. I mean, the lease can go to an intentional community or to a private home homeowner. The lease is independent of the social structure on the land. It's just how are we to transfer from a system of private land ownership to a commons. Mm -hmm. And we suggest it should be regionally based, democratically structured, with representation from all the players, but with at least a third representation from those on the land. Mm 